I'm Malcolm Douglas. All along the east coast of Australia, a lot of time is spent discussing the bars. Now, a coastal bar is not where people drink. It's where the rivers meet the sea. Sandbars often form. The water is very shallow. And so the hazardous conditions make it very dangerous for anyone in a boat attempting to cross the bar. There are a lot of stories about the bars. Some are tragic and many are fascinating. So for the next two months, I'm going to travel from around Lakes Entrance in Victoria, north along the east coast to Moreton Bay in southern Queensland. I'm going to check out all these bars and see how these bars affect the lives of so many people. North from Port Albert along the 90 mile beach, you'll find Lakes Entrance a thriving fishing town with historically one of the most notorious bars on the coast. A hundred years ago, a permanent entrance broke through, and today it's constantly dredged to keep it open. The resulting bar has a fearsome reputation. The huge swell rolls in from Bass Strait, dangerous breakers crashing over the shallows. At such times, the fishing trawlers are tied up for days, the skippers waiting for settled weather when they can safely cross the bar to work Bass Strait. Every time these fishermen leave port, there's a chance that they won't return. The lake's entrance bar is unpredictable, and in the calmest weather, a giant wave can build suddenly, crashing over a boat to cause crippling damage. Returning to port can be even more hazardous. Boats, heavy with the catch, slowly negotiate the shallow, foaming waters and shifting sand, often with disastrous results. Professional fishermen live with these accidents, for the Bass Strait deeps are rich with prawns, lobster and fish, and when conditions are favourable, the returns are immense. Holiday makers and amateur fishermen too are lured out into Bass Strait. Many venture out in small boats, less seaworthy than the trawlers, and they play a dangerous game with luck. Early in 1989, the unfortunate sea fox rolled on the bar. Two women trapped under the hull for 20 minutes were eventually saved by the Ocean Rescue Squad. And the wrecked sea fox lies in pieces, a pathetic reminder of the ferocity of the lake's entrance bar. Within weeks of saving two lives, the men of the Ocean Rescue Squad were involved in their own terrible tragedy. After lifting a seriously ill sailor from a yacht, the seven and a half metre Pas de Lee was returning to lake's entrance through turbulent seas when a freak wave flipped the rescue craft. Everyone was pulled from the water, except the Ocean Rescue Squad skipper, Graham Bassett. Fred, as he was known to all his mates, died in the overturned boat. Cardiac pulmonary resuscitation was administered on the beach without success. The Pardali drifted to shore and lay in the surf, badly damaged, until a large crowd of volunteers were able to turn her over, ready for a tow. Graham Bassett's death and the loss of the ocean rescue boat shocked the fishing community of Lake's entrance and once again demonstrated the cruel impartiality of the sea and the bars. After the tragic loss of their skipper, the volunteer ocean rescue team pulled together and continued their early morning training runs. Using borrowed boats, they perfect their techniques, knowing that at any time, day or night, they can be called out to risk their own lives, saving others on the infamous Lakes Entrance Bar. Before leaving Lakes Entrance, Malcolm gives his new boat a solid workout in the wild waters off the 90 mile beach. The inflatable sides are fixed to a solid fiberglass hull, 
and powered by the 60 horsepower motor, it accelerates quickly to over 40 knots. Further north at Naruma, there's a wild entrance. The bar here was so treacherous that an elaborate breakwater was constructed. When the local rock supply ran out, massive concrete columns were cast. Impressive sentinels breaking up the swell and providing a haven for fish. Regardless of the weather, fishermen work the breakwater for blackfish. Specialists testing their skill against the quarry with fresh weed and light line. These men fish for no other species. Blackfish is the ultimate challenge. The Naruma breakwater was constructed to alter the course of the river, forcing a vigorous flow of water over the bar to scour out the sand and deepen the channel. Here, the breakers are less dangerous for boats leaving the sheltered waters, but sometimes there are reminders of the awesome power of the Naruma bar. At such times, the drama is usually recorded on film or video. One morning, when a particularly strong swell was running, a TV cameraman on holiday shot this film. It shows dramatically just how quickly accidents happen. The big cruiser just managed to beat the waves. But the operator of a smaller boat misjudged the breakers and lost power when his outboard motor was swamped. His passenger was thrown overboard. The Ocean Rescue Squad had responded to calls for assistance and arrived in time to save her before she hit the rocks. The men in this boat were not so lucky. On their way out, they overturned on the bar and were thrown into the water. Another skipper, risking his own boat, powered in close to the breakers and rescued one of them. The other man, unnoticed in the surf, was hit by the rescue boat's propeller. Badly slashed, he's lucky to be alive. Perhaps the most astonishing record of an accident is this amateur video taken a few years ago. A couple had just purchased a boat and without any experience, headed straight out to sea. It was immediately obvious to onlookers that the whole outfit was badly balanced. The motors were too big and the battery and fuel tanks stowed at the back made it all stern heavy. The operator motored too quickly into white water. Within seconds, the boat and lives could very easily have been lost. The passenger was trapped under the boat until another wave freed her. These people, anxious to go fishing, were totally inexperienced and should never have tackled the Naruma bar, especially in a boat so badly balanced. Fortunately, they were wearing life jackets and could be rescued. In 1978, while travelling from Sydney to Port Moresby, Malcolm was caught on a bar. But heading straight into the wave and applying just enough power to control the craft, a possible capsize was averted. Slow motion shows how Malcolm's well-balanced boat drops off the wave and lands perfectly. Crossing the bar requires skill, local knowledge and experience. People make mistakes trying to get through the breakers, often motoring flat out over the waves, sliding into the trough and realising they're in trouble, they turn round and end up in front of a wave instead of behind it. As the boat begins to surf, it broaches and flips.
Malcolm's simulated accident enabled the volunteer rescue group to be involved in a valuable training exercise. rescue groups around the coast of Australia, many more lives would be lost each year. Before heading out to Montague Island, Malcolm tests his boat, making sure it's performing efficiently. A well-balanced boat doesn't lift when it's powered over a wave, and the hull should settle back evenly onto the surface. When a boat does become airborne, the throttle should be eased off. If the motor over revs, it could blow up. Six nautical miles out from Naruma lies Montague Island, one of the best fishing spots along the coast. This huge granite outcrop is a major navigation mark for all coastal shipping. It's also home to a small colony of Australian fur seals. Many of the fishermen hate the seals, complaining that they steal their baits and scare off the fish. Les Anwell, Malcolm's diving companion, braves the strong ocean swell, hoping the seals will join him, but they're evasive. Unusual behaviour for seals. With an Apollo underwater scooter, Malcolm explores the seal's domain. And he's surprised to see masses of fish close to the colony. Only one seal makes an appearance, just for a few seconds, then it too disappears. Malcolm's concerned that conflict with fishermen could drive the seals away from Montague. This has already happened in other parts of New South Wales. Returning to Naruma, the men find the swells up and Malcolm has to cross the bar with extreme caution, staying just behind one breaking wave and ahead of the next one, manoeuvring in the trough until the swell dissipates in the shelter of the breakwater. At Crookhaven, where the Shoalhaven River flows out to sea, there's a more tranquil bar. On the last day of December 1988, there was only a slight swell and no wind. Christmas holidays were in full swing, and over 200 boats left Shoalhaven for the fishing grounds. Within hours, conditions changed dramatically. A massive swell rolled in from New Zealand, and the Shoalhaven bar turned into a death trap. The Volunteer Coastal Patrol worked urgently, escorting dozens of boats back to the safety of the Shoalhaven River. As the bar became more dangerous, the National Safety Council and the Navy helicopters were called in to help. One boat rolled and the occupants were retrieved. A short time later, another boat capsized and two fishermen drowned. For some time, no one knew which boats had gone over and which boats had yet to cross the bar. The families and friends of the fishermen watched anxiously for their return. And even as the drama unfolded, another fisherman was heard calling on his radio for advice on the best way to make it out to sea. He got a very short, terse answer from the authorities. From Crookhaven, Malcolm heads north to the picturesque coast between Wollongong and Sydney. Here, the prevailing southerlies hit the Great Dividing Range, bringing ideal conditions for the local hang gliders. Hey. 
Below the gliders, a few kilometres along the coast, lives a remarkable man, Jack Atwood of Coldale. Jack has manned a volunteer marine radio base from his home for 50 years, and in that time has saved many lives. Of all the rescues that Jack has monitored, the most amazing was the story of the floating lady. There's a woman here. Uh, he was looking back to see the, uh, the police launch coming and he heard a splash and that was his mate. Jumped overboard and when he looked there's a woman and she was floating a mile and a half off Coaldale. Uh, and uh, when he called the Scot and asked the Scot what he would do with her, he said, take her into Balambi and I'll have the intensive care waiting for you. He knew what had happened. They were looking for the woman in the, uh, in the National Park area. So these two guys in the boat literally were going past and one of them just jumped in the water and picked this woman up? Yes, yes. Well, where did she come from? She had walked in the, in the water apparently at half past 12 in the morning. Uh, it was... Uh, well, I shouldn't say this, but she was, uh, had been sick of life. She had uh, had the misfortune of losing a child right. to commit suicide, and uh, uh, we didn't know she was there. And just as it happened, there were, our boat was going to the assistance of the vessel that was seeking. So let's and, get this. In the middle of the night, yes. she walked into the water yes. to commit suicide, yes. but she didn't. No. Is that the story? Yes. And she must have floated out to sea? She did. She floated at sea. And I just, just find that so hard to believe. Yeah. And how long was she floating when the men spotted her and the guy jumped in and picked her up? It was a quarter past 12 in the day. So she'd been floating what, for nearly 12 hours? Yes. That's remarkable. That's, uh, that is. Uh, and could she swim? Could not swim. She Yet she floated. Broke. She, swore she must broke. have just gone into a hypnotic trance or something. She was yes. probably very depressed. Yes. She wanted to die and she couldn't. Yeah. Well, what happened when she got to the hospital? Uh, she survived. She had double pneumonia, uh, but her life was saved. While passing through Sydney, Malcolm hears that Paul Green is about to test his sea bug again. So it's out to Botany Bay to see how the vehicle is performing. Paul tried to cross Bass Strait in this amphibious Volkswagen three years ago, and it's now been modified several times. You, 200 metres out into Botany Bay, there are problems. The new propeller drive shaft is not working, so it's back to the drawing board. A week later, there's another trial. Paul's keen to have the sea bug performing well before he announces the date for another go at Bass Strait, sometime in 1990. A brief stop on the beach frustratingly becomes a one-hour bog. Paul's quite convinced that eventually he will cross Bass Strait from Victoria to Tasmania in this strange craft. These sea trials are the first since his abortive attempt from Port Albert. The sea bug comes to a halt when it runs out of petrol. Malcolm leaves Paul motoring around on Botany Bay and heads for Seal Rocks, 300 kilometres north of Sydney. This underwater world of breathtaking beauty is a favourite place for sharks. They fascinate Malcolm, and he's keen to see for himself just how many there are around the rocks. The diving flag is positioned, and he swims slowly down to the largest cave. Immediately, he's surrounded by Grey Nurse, schooling in almost unbelievable numbers.
Until recently, they were declared man-eaters and for many years were killed indiscriminately. During the early 60s, when the explosive spearhead was developed, spear fishermen slaughtered huge numbers of grey nurse. So many sharks were killed that they virtually disappeared. In 1984, the grey nurse were protected, and now divers are once again able to witness this amazing spectacle. Malcolm takes great care to move slowly so that he will not alarm the sharks. They return to this cave periodically during calm weather, probably to rest after feeding. The grey nurse has a ferocious appearance, with a hideous array of thin, needle-sharp teeth. Malcolm's only concern is that if he inadvertently panics the sharks, he could be injured when they push past him towards open water. Cautiously moving through the mass, Malcolm tries to count them. There are so many milling about that he loses count at a hundred. turtle, a resident of Seal Rock, swims lazily past, oblivious of the menace of the sharks. Away from the cave, the grey nurse are more edgy. There seems to be an association between the sharks and the small fish. They seek refuge amongst the sharks where they're protected from the large pelagic fish, such as dewfish and kingfish, that are chased and eaten by the grey nurse. 25 years ago, when the sharks were slaughtered here, the fish population decreased and the seals disappeared. Now that the sharks are back and the small schooling fish are again plentiful, the seals too might return. During most underwater filming, lights are used to highlight the colours, but when the lights are turned off, an eerie, mysterious scene is revealed as the grey nurse crews past like silent silver shadows. After such an exhilarating day, Malcolm's keen to spend some time with another marine species that's returning from the brink of extinction. When the spear gun was invented, the majestic blue groper were easy prey. So ferocious was the slaughter of these magnificent fish that 20 years ago they were officially protected. This new generation have little fear of humans, milling around looking for food. A few kilometres from Seal Rocks at the twin towns of Foster Tuncurry, the swell forms into sweeping surf beyond the breakwater, and at the end of the day, many of the locals are in the water catching a wave. Others too enjoy the surf, chasing the voracious tailor. Professional fishermen also work the coast. When the mullet migrate north, the men position their boats. At sunup each day, the first team onto the beach has prior right to the best position. A spotter, high on the point, watches for signs of the fish.
there are many teams trying to net the migrating mullet for the rewards are great. When the mullet are trapped, they're manoeuvred into a pocket that detaches from the main net. Smaller bags are quickly filled and the fish carted straight to the cooperative and on to Brisbane for sale. Arriving at Woolai, Malcolm calls in to see Stan Young, the farmer responsible for growing so many of the state's delicious oysters. Malcolm heads down river with Stan and his team to see how the oysters are collected when they're still microscopic larvae floating on the currents. When there's a big tide, the water temperature changes and the salinity alters. This triggers the mature oysters to release up to 30 million of the larvae at a time. They drift with the current and these lime-coated domes, called witches' hats, are anchor points for the tiny animals. You see this witch's hat here, there's not a lot of voices on that one there, Martin, because um, the fish have come along and eaten all the voices yeah, right. off the top on there, see? Now, that one there is a typical um, witch's hat. He's got roughly around about 7,000 oysters to 10,000 on him. Um, he's been down here for a period of three months. Um, he's got to go to the shed to be, to be flexed off. So, in sure. other words, all the larvae just flowing through the water here, right? That's right. Yes. And it just, how does it land on here? Um, what it does, it, um, we, we place these at a certain level in the water, yeah. right? Um, the larvae comes down with the tide, yep. right, sits at a certain level in the water. These are placed there, the old larvae comes along and he's got a little eye and a little foot on him. Yeah, right. Comes along and he, he sees his mate over here, because they're gregarious, and he says, right, he said, I'll, I'll go over there next to Sam, see? Yeah. So he comes along and he puts his little foot out, cleans a little spot, the little eye sees where he is, and that's where he attaches himself. And he stays there until, you know, for a period of three months like now, we get it now, this, this whole, whole witch's hat and the rest underneath. We take the whole of back to the shed and we flex them off and then they go on trays. What we do to get the oysters off this, we just flex it from side to side. This. Now whatever is left on there, we just give that a bit of a flex and we bang it. I'm sure it comes off. And now this is all the oysters yeah, on we'll, here. Yeah, we'll spread her out a bit here. And just very nice and like that. Yeah. And that's all your oysters on your, on your pieces of line there. Yeah. What happens, they go out and the water slowly breaks down the line on the back. So that line will just dissolve away? Yeah, it does gradually, yeah, just dissolve away. There are a number of methods used to collect the larvae. The men scrape off millions of oysters that have attached themselves over the past eight weeks. Among this slurry of sediment are at least 5,000 minute oysters. They're spread on trays and the rubbish is hosed away before the oysters are covered, ready for placement back in the river. The oysters grow quickly in the trays. After eight weeks, they've tripled in size and are sold to oyster farmers all along the coast. Why do you grow the oysters here at Willow? Um, well, the reason being is this river here is a, uh, a non-pollutant river. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to be um, one of the best catching rivers in New South Wales. We have no... Well, what about the flavour of the oyster? Well, the flavour of the oyster, well, that's, that's an old argument. Yeah. You know, like, um, I think... Yeah, myself, but being an oyster farmer, they'd be pretty good oysters, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah, excellent, <laughs> excellent oyster. Three years later, the oysters are ready for market. Oysters vary in flavour depending on where they grow and what time of the year they're opened. The next day, Malcolm looks out over the boiling Woolye Bar. He was planning to go diving, but it's just too rough. Heading back to the highway, Malcolm's startled to see a dingo beside the road. A magnificent young male. It's obviously not afraid of humans, and as it begins scavenging around the Land Rover, Malcolm offers it some bread. Normally, he would never feed a wild animal, but he's so surprised to see a purebred dingo so close to Sydney, he's determined to record the animal's behaviour on film. 
This dingo has obviously been accepting food from humans for some time, but it's still nervous and will not venture too close. After talking with the locals, Malcolm learns that this area is completely surrounded by national parks and the fishing community has no wish to harm the dingoes. Torrential rains cut many of the roads around Grafton and only after several days is Malcolm able to reach Ballino where he calls in at the La Balsa Maritime Museum. For years Malcolm has admired the exploits of the La Balsa expedition and he's at last able to view one of the rafts. In 1973, three rafts manned by 12 men drifted over 14,000 kilometres across the Pacific Ocean from Ecuador in South America to Ballina in Australia. The expedition leader, Vital Alsar, hoped to prove that similar rafts carrying South American Indians could have made the crossing in earlier times. Each raft comprising seven balsa tree logs cut from the South American jungles was held together with wooden pegs and sisal ropes. After 178 days, the expedition reached Australia, where the rafts were towed into Ballina to a hero's welcome. One raft is now displayed here as a major tourist attraction and as a monument to the 12 gallant adventurers. After the recent storms, the Ballina Bar is wild and the usually clear blue water, muddy brown. The floodwaters rushing down the Richmond River push into the sea, scouring up a hazardous bar. Among the rocks at the end of the breakwater, a family of feral cats compete with the seagulls and terns for scraps left by fishermen. The cats also keep an eye on the birds as a prospective meal. The Richmond is such a busy waterway that the volunteer Coast Guard have constructed a unique observation tower and radio room to constantly monitor the bar. At the height of the floods, the 10-metre game fishing boat, the Innovator, ran the bar, but the huge waves smashed into the hull, sinking the big boat. The crew were saved, but the wreck of the Innovator was later washed up on the beach and salvaged. Evans Head, serene under a heavy cloud cover, also boasts a killer bar. This crew, unfamiliar with local conditions, misjudged the waves and their trawler rolled. Evans Head is famous for its prawns and fish. Jewfish and snapper are a typical morning's catch. And the local pelicans are never far from the cleaning troughs. Malcolm's heard that the prawn trawlers are out at sea. They normally work at night, but the recent floods have stirred up so much silt that the prawns, feeling safe in the dirty water, are moving by day. With experience and intuition, the fishermen are able to position their nets on the seafloor and scoop the prawns into narrow pockets at the rear of the wider nets. Every hour, the nets are retrieved. The prawns are washed in seawater to separate any small dead fish. Then there's the tedious job of picking out all the other crustaceans. Within minutes of being brought up from the bottom, the prawns are cooked in boiling seawater. They're rinsed in cold seawater and kept on ice until the men return to port at the end of the day. After a great feed of fresh prawns, Malcolm's on his way again. Further north along the coast, the next most perilous bar is found at the small fishing community of Brunswick Heads, a narrow, shallow entrance. It's notoriously bad during the summer months when cyclonic storms far out in the Coral Sea produce huge swells that surge and curl savagely, only metres from the breakwater. The waves follow so closely, it's virtually impossible for boats to leave or enter the harbour after the storm surge. The fishermen often have to wait a week or more before they can run the bar. As the sea settles, the skipper still has to read conditions carefully and when there's a lull, make a dash for open water. Many trawlers come to grief here. These remarkable photos were taken by a fisherman just on sundown. A prawn boat was hit by what the locals call a killer wave. 
a giant curler that literally appears from nowhere during calm weather. The bridge, steering wheel and controls were smashed. He's a very lucky fisherman. Not so lucky was this crew. They ended up on the breakwater trying to cross the bar. The trawler was washed into the harbour during several high tides and it was decided to drag the sunken vessel onto the beach with a bulldozer. Five days later, the wreckage lay scattered across the sands. Boats frequently fall victim to this vicious bar. Recently, the 20-ton Elna was rammed onto the rocks. With its rudder and propeller broken, the Elna drifted back out into the breakers, where it capsized. It was thrown up on a sandbar near the beach, but salvage operations were successful and the boat is to be rebuilt. Amateur fishermen, too, chance their luck on the Brunswick Heads Bar. The fish are plentiful, but the risks are great. Like the other teams up and down the coast, the volunteer rescue members are always ready to assist in an emergency. This bar is so devious that they operate two different types of rescue craft, and they're out regularly fine-tuning the boats and their rescue techniques. Anne Berry, a resident of Brunswick Heads, knows how pitiless a bar can be. 20 years ago, on the Turos Bar, south of Sydney, she had a shocking experience. So we, we got into the boat and, uh, and, and took off through the entrance. And we were about halfway over the bar, I suppose, and, and, and we just struck freak waves. Uh, you know, this wave just came up and it was so enormous and it just smashed all the windows on the boat. How big was your boat? It was 18, an 18-foot 18 half-cabin cruiser. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It was the biggest boat on the lake. Mm. And, um, and then it was just, you know, one, one wave after the other, just smashing all the windows. And eventually the, the boat was, was full of water. And, uh, and John said, we'd better bail out. So Lou and John picked up some buckets and they just started. And then this wave came and it was, it was as tall and straight as a house. And it just hung there, mm. motion, motionlessly. And then and John turned around and he said, Jesus Christ, we've had it now. And he turned the boat into the wave and mm. it just capsized our boat like it was a little matchbox. You type. had jackets on it this time? We, yeah, we, we were wearing life jackets, yeah. Um, well, I, I knew I knew that my life jacket wasn't working because I had to keep pulling it down at the sides right. to keep my head above the water. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I later, uh, now I eventually, after about an hour on the sea, I, I made it. I made it to a rock. And then for the next hour, I was watching uh, my husband and his friend just floating dead underneath me. It wasn't until the court case that I, I learned that when they pulled their bodies out of the water, the life jackets had ridden up their backs. And, and when they flooded underneath me in the lake, eventually when they washed into the lake, the, the water was just lapping over their mouths. The two Anne was so convinced that the life jackets were inadequate that she had them tested by an independent body yeah. and found that they were dangerous in rough water. Yeah. Yeah. And they found you. So this particular company, what, well, you took them to court, did you? Yes, I sued the life jacket people. Yes, mm -hmm. and you won the case? I won the case. Yeah. Well, they had been tested, you know, by the Safety Standards Association. Yeah, but, they... but they'd only been tested in still water. Mm. They'd never been tested in the sea, so we thought that, that we were safe. The mood of the Brunswick Heads Bar changes constantly. After a particularly ferocious storm, Malcolm decides to really put the bombard through its paces. His inflatable balanced perfectly with sand to ensure maximum performance. A new type of rigid hull inflatable, Malcolm's testing it for Australian conditions.
Two hours north of Brunswick Heads is Queensland's Gold Coast, usually offering wonderful weather and great surf, but all is not well here. The recent violent cyclonic storms have battered the coast and the aftermath is devastating. Where there were once wide sandy beaches, there is now serious beach erosion. At North Kira Beach, kilometres of coast have been badly affected and at high tide there's no sand left at all. It's a massive ecological disaster. Many people blame the new breakwater on the Tweed Heads Bar, which they claim has stopped the natural flow of sand northwards. On Kira Beach, a canvas-filled retaining wall holds sand on the southern side. But over on the north, it's bare. Now the incessant waves are breaking down the retaining wall. Above all the problems, the surface paradise skyscrapers dominate the coastline, multiplying indiscriminately. And a new generation of young volunteer surf lifesavers patrol in their outboard motor-powered inflatable boats. has several monstrous bars and conditions can change rapidly. In 1987, at the end of the Jupiter Sydney to Southport yacht race, the weather was appalling as gusting 50 knot winds whipped up mountainous seas, pounding the competitors for 48 hours. Three metre waves on the bar made a crossing almost impossible. Coast Guard and Air Sea Rescue were on full alert. Taking water and with steering problems, the 10-metre sloop Mutineer was halfway across the bar when it broached and almost capsized. The Heart of Oak approached the bar but aborted its first attempt to avoid a swamping. The sloop Lockenbar, with its headsail in tatters, made it across the bar. And the Russell Dean too got in safely after being lost for several hours and at one stage sending out a mayday call. One of the most dramatic bar accidents on the Queensland coast was recorded by a television cameraman. A yacht with torn sails and engine failure was drifting erratically when the skipper, Malcolm Dixon, radioed for help. Huddled below deck was Dixon's companion and their two-year-old daughter. A mountainous wave rolled the yacht 360 degrees. Miraculously, no one was seriously hurt, and Dixon struggled back on board. When the Redcliffe Coast Guard Shark Cat arrived, one of its engines failed. drifting helplessly side on in the trough, the inevitable happened. Once again, no one was seriously hurt. After several attempts, the rescue helicopter managed to get one of the men on board.
tension mounted as the skid hit the boat during the second pickup, and the pilot hastily powered away to safety. This incident clearly illustrates just how quickly accidents can happen when boats get into difficulty crossing the bar. With the onslaught of cold weather, it's time for Malcolm to leave the East Coast and head back to the Kimberley where he'll spend the winter out bush.